we are pretty much continuing from where we started okay so let me just increase my display time okay great so we were looking at this uh, particular example where we, yeah so we had talked about uh, gravitational potential energy so we're looking at this example an asteroid with mass 1 times 10 to power to power okay so an asteroid with mass 1 times 10 to power 9 kg comes from deep space effectively from infinity so the moment you see infinity we said that's actually where we use what's this that's where we actually use a gravitational potential energy in this particular context when something is very far away from the what away from the uh, surface of uh, the earth okay so th that's a pointer there so effectively from infinity and force towards earth find the change in potential energy when it reaches uh, 4 times 10 to power 8 meters from the center of the earth just beyond the orbital radius of the moon in addition find the work done by the force of gravity b calculate the asteroid speed at that point assuming that it was initially at rest when it was arbitrarily far away how much work have to be would have to be done on the asteroid by some other agent so the asteroid will be traveling at only half the speed found in b at the same point so i i explained how we are going to do this uh yesterday so the last part is simply asking us about what friction or force because you know friction is always going to be an external force isn't it so what that uh, entails is that uh we are going to be looking at friction okay so for the last question we are simply finding uh, the work done by friction so uh, having done that or said that i think we are good to go so uh the question is telling us to find what to find the gravitational potential energy isn't it so or the change in gravitational potential energy so or the change in potential energy right so what we do here is So the change in potential energy is what is going to be initial times what times uh no sorry it's going to be final minus initial right and but we know that because it's coming from an infinity point so we are going to use not the one that we used last time but oh, but we are going to use this particular uh equation the one where we are considering the g so we are having so mass of the earth then mass of the asteroid final radius minus mass of the earth mass of the asteroid initial radius right okay so then what we then do at this point just to lessen the work what you do is you can actually factor out the common things this is just done to make the work easier so what you do is you factor out the uh the positive the positive parts right so the positive part you just factor out the g the mass of the earth and the mass of the asteroid then what's going to remain is for this one you're going to get negative one over final radius then here it's going to be minus minus it's going to be positive one over r initial isn't it 
So that's what you're going to get. So then you see that when you do it like this, it then becomes uh, pretty much a little bit straightforward. And how we go about this is we are going to say, uh, what is our G? So G is... So then the math of the earth. Okay, then the mass of the asteroid. Okay. Then we now get, now, when we now talk about the radius, that's where we have to really do a little bit of thinking. So the final radius, it's that one where they're telling us now uh, that it reaches a point where it's 4 times 10 to power 8 meters, right? So that's the final radius, isn't it? So that's the final radius of this particular thing. plus now remember then we are now saying one over initial one over initial radius now let me ask uh the initial radius the question was telling us that it was what it was infinity and we know that one over infinity is what one over infinity is zero isn't it so meaning that here you are getting a zero Okay, because anything that is, remember, we, we, I'm sure you've done your calculus, right? So you talked about moving a function to infinity. When you're moving a function to infinity, what actually happens is that it's going towards becoming zero, but it's not zero. I hope that adds up, right? So uh, that's the thing that's very, very important to take note of. So once we have this it's just really about using the calculator well and uh you'll be able to find your answer as negative okay so negative 9.97 times 10 to power 14 joules right so that would that was the change in the potential energy so now then the question went on to ask us to say if that's the potential energy find the work done by gravity but this was something that we discussed yesterday we said the work done by gravity is what is minus the change in potential energy so we found out the change in potential in it so what you do is you just simply multiply what we found by negative one So, yeah, so it's just basically the positive of the potential, of the change in potential energy, like I had explained yesterday. Then the second part is asking us, calculate the asteroid speed at that point, meaning at that point when it's having a radius of 4 times 10 to power 8 meters from the center of the Earth, right? So then what we are going to do is, here we're just using conservation of energy. You know that here there is no friction. So you know that if there is no friction, we know that the work done by non-conservative force is equal to the change in potential energy plus change in kinetic energy. What is the work done by non-conservative forces? We are assuming that there is no friction here. 
So if there is no friction and no any other external thing, meaning the work done by non-conservative forces is zero. So we can then rewrite this and say change in potential energy plus change in kinetic energy is equals to what? To zero. So after we've done that, then we then proceed and say, so what are we looking at here pretty much? So really for change in kinetic in, in potential energy we have, then for kinetic energy, it's why it's interesting. But, but remember they told us to say this asteroid, it was at rest before it started moving, right? So that's what we are using. It was at rest before it started moving. So because of that, we know that its initial potential energy is what is zero. So the change in potential energy, remember, it was negative 9 then final kinetic energy it's the one for which we are trying to find this this the speed isn't it then we know the initial is going to be zero because the question told us that this particular stone or this particular asteroid was actually at rest huh? so once we've done this really it's pretty much about algebra so what we do here is we okay so we say let's uh can someone with a calculator just be ready to assist so we move this to this side it becomes what it becomes negative half m v final squared right so pretty much we, we know what the mass of this thing is isn't it the mass of the asteroid so what we are going to do then is we are going to make uh if we want to make this easier we can multiply through by negative two so we get rid of that negative half and then that would make this double so can someone just assist us with uh, the computation of these things so that we can uh, work out quicker. So then, you know, the mass, so what we are going to do to save on time, divide by the mass of the asteroid, right? Which they've told us that the mass of the asteroid is... So can someone just help us to do this computation and just help us with an answer? We really, really appreciate. So as uh, the person is doing that, we can be thinking about the second question or the third question. So the third question is then asking us that if then we figure out that the final speed that we've, uh, the final speed that this asteroid has is actually half of what we've calculated what external force would have been acting on this particular asteroid so in essence they are just asking us for what so in essence they are just asking us for the amount of friction force that was actually acting on this particular uh, asteroid right so that's basically what they are just trying to ask us for so now we know that uh, frictional force that uh, we, whenever we are using the principles of uh, work uh, we know that's a non-conservative what that's a non-conservative force so because it's a non-conservative force what then we are going to get is that uh, this equation is going to have a non-conservative force Remember that in the earlier question, it was zero because there was no friction. But now, the friction is there. So meaning what we are calculating for is what? Is this work done by a non-conservative force? Since friction is a non-conservative force. But they are now telling us to say, actually, what's happening at this point is that the work which is being done by friction, we know that that's going to be 
uh, a work which is due to friction, right? And then they are telling us that uh, the, the speed of the asteroid was actually half of what we had found. So that final speed that we found, when we come to the, kin to the kinetic energy part, we have to make it half. Because the question is saying, how much work would have been done, or sorry, how much work would have to be done on the asteroid by some other agent, so the asteroid would be traveling at only half the speed found in B at the same point. Huh? So that's an important point to take note of. So then what we are going to have, so we know that the change in potential energy is still the same. Then, what do we then know about this is that uh, then uh, we know that for the kinetic energy, the initial still remains zero because it started from rest, isn't it? So we're only focusing about the final. Okay, so we're only focusing about the final. So the mass of the asteroid since we know that kinetic energy is mass times velocity squared, isn't it? So, and then this, the velocity we are using half of what we actually, what of we actually found. Because that's what the question is saying. So we are then trying to find what amount of work had to be done to actually make this velocity a half of what we were expecting what we had calculated in the absence of of uh, of friction huh? or of an external force so what, what we are finding the work done by non-conservative force is negative which makes sense Okay, let me write that properly. So, yeah, so that's how you basically answer. So, like I said yesterday, where the money really is with these questions, it's just about understanding really uh the concepts that's why we took a good amount of time yesterday just for us to be able to understand the concepts so we then now go to the escape speed okay so what really is the escape speed so what happens is that if we're i'm sure you've seen how rockets move up right if we are to get a rocket and then we move it up with a large amount of speed it can actually move into space and never return. It's like it can just go and never return. So this speed, it's actually called the S escape speed. Why is it called escape? Because when you are escaping from prison, you don't intend on coming back, right? So when someone is escaping, they don't intend on going back to where they were escaping from right so the so that's the instance there or sometimes it's also called escape velocity but uh, people think it's pretty much more appropriate to call it a speed so uh in case you may want a derivation this is how it's derived so you you see there that what we are looking at it's uh this particular object uh that you are having so you've got uh, the conservation of energy, isn't it? Because you, you don't have any friction here. And we know that for conservation of energy, we say initial potential energy plus initial kinetic energy is equals to uh, kinetic energy final, potential energy final. So now when you write them now, uh, you're going to have that particular equation. Huh? And we know why our potential energy is written like that because we are taking note of the fact that uh, it's going very very high so uh, it's something that's very very high so we use that gravitational potential energy 
So now one thing that we can then uh, think of is this particular object, okay? If then we think of this speed that the object had to be very, very high or to be a very, very large speed, that's the one which we are calling the VI or the velocity initial. And that's the escape velocity, right? So already you can change that from VI into initial velocity. Then what's going to happen is when this object reaches where it reaches, it's going to have a how can i put it first of all okay yeah okay before you can talk about that it's very very important to take note of the fact that uh when the object is at an infinite distance from earth its kinetic energy is zero it's you know because this particular object is no longer moving okay it's just going to be stationary whether it's in space or ever where it's going to go and then the other thing which is uh, important to take note of is that gravitational potential energy is also going to be zero because this object is going potentially in, uh, what can I say, it's going uh, potentially infinity, okay? So it's going infinity or it's going infinite, okay? So because of that, like we saw, uh, one divided by R, you know, and R is the radius the distance away from the earth that's going uh, towards uh, positive infinity so one over r goes to what to zero as r goes to infinity so what's going to happen is that the total mechanical energy is going to be what is going to be zero okay it's going to be zero and kinetic energy and all those things anyways yeah so the the equations that we are having there on top that e equation there on top it's for the initials right initial kinetic energy initial potential energy now we are just writing their formulae right but we know that they are, when we equate them to their finals their finals are going to be zero for those uh, reasons that i'm just from explaining so because their finals are zero you know that that initial speed with which the object left earth that's the what that's the escape speed so you just simply change the vi into v e s c escape okay and uh once you do that you then just simply make uh and then you see that you can actually cancel out the m you can see that that you can cancel out the mass of the object since it's all it's uh it when you take this g mass of the earth m and over radius of the earth when you take it to the other side you can actually cancel out the mass of the particular object so uh, simplifying that you make uh, the escape speed the uh, subject of the formula you see that you are getting that formula for the escape speed so having done that let's look at an example then we can talk about the kepler's law I'm sure we, sh we should finish this this topic today. There's really not much to talk about. So, so let's look at an example quickly, and then we can uh, talk about the Kepler's laws. So, uh, in Jules Verne's classic novel, From the Earth to the Moon, a giant cannon dug into the Earth in Florida, fired the spacecraft all the way to the moon. If the spacecraft leaves the cannon, at escape speed so one thing is that the escape speed for the earth has actually been found okay so that's 11.2 kilometers per second so that's a lot huh? that's a lot okay so leaves at escape speed so when we just say escape speed under ideal conditions sometimes they will expect you to know it but usually the physics department can just give it to you anyway but uh in case you are able to know it that would be great okay so uh if the spacecraft leaves the cannon at escape speed at what speed is it moving when uh it's 1.5 times 10 to power 5 kilometers from the center of the earth uh neglect any friction effects okay 
then b approximately what constant acceleration is needed to propel the spacecraft to escape speed through a cannon bow uh, one kilometer long so here they're just saying when let's say this spacecraft leaves with uh, leaves the cannon at, at escape speed at what speed is it moving when it reaches 1.5 times 10 to power 5 kilometers uh from the center of the earth then the other one so we are there we're trying to calculate the final speed okay we're trying to calculate the final speed then uh the other thing that is very very interesting there it's about uh, calculating the constant acceleration so let's begin to solve as we talk so that we don't uh, waste time so uh remember what we are looking at in, in our building of that example some or, or rather in of that equation we are assuming that this particular thing we are looking at goes to infinity but this thing hasn't gone to infinity so meaning that uh we are going to have final and uh final potential energy final gravitational potential energy and final kinetic energy okay we are going to have those because why it has not gone to infinity they've given us the radius uh or the uh, the altitude okay from the from the center of the earth so meaning that it's not going to infinity and if it's not going to infinity meaning uh it still has kinetic energy it still has gravitational potential energy so we're just going to write so what then we do is we then just uh plug in the value uh, the Let's write the equation. So here it's going to be negative mm -hmm. because of the uh, formula. Over the radius of the earth. So I'm sure you can see that here we can uh, multiply through by 2 and we can also cancel the mass since it's appearing on both sides. Huh? So we can say we multiply by 2 over m. So 2 over m meaning is it means that it cancels that, it cancels that also cancels the m's there right okay great so many what we are remaining with is uh we got that then this one now becomes a two because remember we've multiplied through a two Sorry, pardon me. So then what we do, just to make these things look neat. So we know that the initial speed is the same as the, um, the, um, the escape speed, right? Because that's what the object left with. So let's just move this to the left so that we can remain with the final velocity which we are trying to calculate. So when we move this to this side, we are going to have initial velocity 2g that over r e 
then we're going to have plus 2gme over that okay and like we did with that other oh sorry sorry for this for the final it should no longer be ra because this thing has now gone above the earth okay so it's not the same as the radius of the earth pardon me for that mistake it's no longer the radius so it's got an so we are actually going to have a different radius isn't it we are going to have a different radius so that's something important to take note of mm -hmm. and that is going to be as a result as an addition of the earth's radius plus uh okay sorry it's going to be the earth's radius and then we are also going to get what that final radius is okay yeah so we are we are we are not adding anything at this point okay great so having done this we know what the escape speed is so let's just start factoring in things so the escape speed of the earth we know it's 11.2 kilometers per second but yeah is it per second yes per second so just converting that to meters per second we are going to have 1.12 1, times 10 to power 4 meters per second you square it then for this one if you want to make it your work easier you can just factor out this 2g so okay factor out this 2g then um what you're going to leave is you are leaving um negative re oh, one over radius of the earth plus one over the final radius of this thing right okay so that's how you could uh, make things better maybe we can even just uh for the sake of following steps let's just still leave it at that so that no one misses out so now after this we can now then factor in then we put the mass of the earth and then we put now those things so we put uh, the ra okay so we put the radius of the earth So that's going to be then the final distance this thing was above. So that's it. we convert it from kilometers to meters. So since it was 1.5 times 10 to power 5. Since we know that a kilometer is uh, 
just what that's 1000 meters right so we just add three zeros to that then we are going to get our value i know this will have to to square so you find the answer then you find the square root then you are going to have this but i'll just skip the squaring the square root part just so that we could save on time to finish this topic so yeah so pretty much that's how you uh solve that one then for b we are then being asked at approximately what constant acceleration is needed to propel the space the spacecraft to escape speed through a cannon so then now you are think you are talking about uh this thing is in a cannon and then you want to propel it to reach escape speed so it's starting from rest maybe it would start from rest uh i'm just saying maybe and actually it, yeah so it, for this for that other one it started from uh, escape speed that's fine but this other one it's starting from rest and so you have to provide a certain acceleration so then they're asking what amount of acceleration do you have to produce if this thing is starting from rest and then it has to move through a ball which is one kilometer long so what you are basically asking is what acceleration is required to move this particular ball uh, from initial velocity of zero to a final velocity which is the escape speed which is going to be this over a, over a distance of what? 1000 meters, which is one kilometer. So when you look at what the question has given us, you can calculate acceleration. So here they're just playing around with your basic kinematics So, what you then do is, you just simply substitute. Then it was starting from rest. Then it had to move through a ball of uh, one meter, sorry, one kilometer which is 1000 meters. So the acceleration we are getting is So that's about it. So you see that's a lot of acceleration. So if it's starting from rest for it because by the time it's leaving that 1000 meter ball it needs to have reached the what the escape speed so that it can go up and up and up so that's basically that now we can look at the kepler's laws so really what kepler uh the introduction is that people used to think that uh, the way the universe was they were thinking that the earth was the center of the universe so that's what people were thinking and this was called the geocentric remember geo then we are talking about the earth right geography right so the geocentric model was the model where people are thinking the earth was the center of the universe and everything was revolving around the earth until after some time when they thought that actually the earth and other planets revolve in circular orbits around the what around the sun and that was the heliocentric model. So now, uh, the analysis of these things and how they came to realize 
that actually the planets and the earth involved uh, included tend to move uh in in, in, uh, in an elliptical uh fashion around the the sun this was actually realized and summarized in the kepler's laws so the first one was that all planets move in elliptical orbits with the sun as at one of the focal points so that's the first law so what this simply means is that and that's why you see that sometimes we'll say that the earth will be closest to the moon uh sometimes it will be furthest from the from the sun things like that right it's because like you would see here if the earth is uh, at this point where it they are showing it where they are showing it right it, it, it's very far from the what from the sun but there's going to be a point when in its moving it's going to be here you see so that's basically what kepler was saying and that's what the first law is basically saying then the second law was saying that a line drawn from the sun to any planet sweeps out equal areas in equal time intervals so what basically kepler here was saying is that if you've got a planet here right so let's look at uh so let me just zoom this so we can be able to appreciate so what kepler is saying is if you are looking at a planet and it moves from this point to this point and then let's do this okay let's just remove that okay so let's just uh okay that's not supposed to happen okay yeah so what basically kepler was saying is that if you've got a planet right and then as the planet is revolving around the sun and it moves from point a to point uh to from point a to point b okay and then you would see as though it's not covering a lot of distance isn't it because it's further away from the sun okay but then on the opposite side of the orbit the planet moves from uh point c to point d in the same period of time so what basically it was saying is because these planets because or rather let me say this planet because this planet is at this point further away from the sun so it has to cover more distance just to move from a from point a to point b and then but when it's closer to the sun it's going to cover a distance which is going to seem relatively bigger right because when when we're looking at the arc of uh, uh you know this ellipse right it's going to seem relatively bigger like you could see c and d seems to be larger the 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 arc length seems to be larger than what than uh than a to b now the interesting thing is when you get the areas of those you've seen those shaded things right when you get the areas of those shapes which have been formed they had the same area so that's what the point is saying that a line drawn from the sun to any planet sweeps out equal areas in equal time intervals so if planet a uh oh sorry if that planet moves from a to b in five hours and then it also moves from c to d in five hours the fact that is the same time interval it means that those areas which are shaded when you from the sun to those to point a and b and from the sun to point c and d the areas of those shapes are going to be what are going to be the same that's kepler's second law then the third law is the square of the orbital period of any planet is proportional to the cube don't worry I'll, I'll explain this is proportional to the cube of the average distance from the planet to the sun so uh here it's basically what is just trying to say so uh let's start with the, a, a little bit of the derivation so driving this you look at we are first talking about the centripetal what centripetal uh acceleration huh? So we are start so you can see that's the mp there that's for a planet mp 
that cap P there is for planet. Huh? So the mass of the planet times the centripetal acceleration is going to be, you, you can also rewrite that to be mass of the planet times the speed with which it's moving over the hour. So these planets move possibly at a constant speed, right? So we can actually be able to rewrite this as, okay, so we know that it's the gravity which is providing the centripetal what? force. We know that centripetal force is not a force in itself. It's just a type of a force that is provided by another force. So in this context, it's being provided by the what? It's being provided by the gravity, okay? So now what we are seeing there is you see that centripetal force and the gravity. So you see that you can cancel out the mass of the planet, okay? So you can cancel out the mass of the planet. So that mass of the planet goes away, isn't it? So that's something that's important to take note of. Then actually, when you look at it, you can even cancel out um okay i think for, for now we can leave it here so now you see that mass of the planet is out so now let's now look at what we are remaining with then when you look of when you think about speed okay what is speed speed is basically distance over time right so when we think of the circumference of the orbit the circumference of the orbit is going to be what? It's going to be 2 pi r, isn't it? So 2 pi r, that's the circumference of that particular thing, right? That, that, that would be the circumference of that elliptical thing or circular orbit, right? So it's going to be 2 pi r. Then over, so this means that the speed of the planet in its orbit is equal to the circumference of the orbit, which is 2 pi r divided by the time required for one revolution so the time required for a planet to move or to make one revolution is what you call the period of the planet you may remember that planets have got different periods there are certain periods that take longer to go around the sun and for earth it actually takes a year isn't it yeah so that's about it so the speed of the planet is equal to the circumference of the orbit, which is 2 pi r, divided by the time required for one revolution, which is the period of the planet, which is T, capital T. So meaning that where we had V squared there, when we replace this 2 pi r over T, that's the replacement which has been done there. You, 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 you can see the replacement there. Then when you square that, that's how come and when you square that and then you make t the subject of the formula that's where we have that formula and then you see that that ks has basically substituted everything that 4 pi squared over g and the mass of the sun so that's ms that's for the mass of the sun huh? so you see that ks has uh, substituted that and then here it's data like the period for the the period for the uh, for the planet. So in case the equation you are dealing with has got Earth, meaning you use the values for Earth, depending on what you are dealing with. So now that KS, you see that what the KS is, is replacing, it's replacing things that are constant. Pi is always going to be pi. Uh, G is, go, is always going to be G. That's the gravitational constant. Huh? Then mass of the sun, the mass of the sun is, sun is always going to be the same. So that entails that uh, when we con when we use this data here, you, when we get the G and the mass of the sun, we actually get a value for Ks. That's that value there using the data here, right? So having done that, then we can actually play around with these values and then actually figure out to say... Uh, the square of the planet's period it's actually equal to the cube of the acceleration so that's an important formula which uh, it would be handful to know so uh basically we just have to do one last example then we are done with this topic i know it it, it was lengthy uh but uh uh, worth it. 
So now, okay, but before we can proceed, has everyone understood this? Okay, so from a telecommunications point of view, it's advantageous for satellites to remain at the same location relative to a location on Earth. This can occur only if the satellite's orbital period is the same as the Earth's period of rotation, approximately 24 hours. At what distance from the center of the Earth can this geosynchronous orbit be found? Okay, so these are people that are trying to set up uh, a, a satellite and because they want it to be at the same position, so they want it to be rotating or rather they want it to be having a period around the Earth, the same as the period of, the, the same as the Earth's period of rotation, which is a day. So must have, whenever they want to fly and find the satellite, it will be easy to find. So it's geosynchronous. Huh? synchronous so meaning that it's uh somewhat uh close to the earth or not rather close to the earth but it's in sync with the earth okay so the first question is at what distance from the center of the earth can this geosynchronous orbit be found what is the orbital speed of the satellite so those are very very wonderful questions so let's then proceed to answer them so really for this question it's about knowing the formula or the formula so the question is asking us to find uh, at what distance from the center of the earth can this ge uh, geosynchronous orbit be found so this is what they're asking us to find the radius because radius signifies what radius signifies the uh, distance above the center of the earth isn't it so that's something that we have to take note of so what then do we do we then have to think about uh, the period so the the formula that we are going to use it's going to be k plus the one from k plus third law So I made a mistake. It should be squared. Then this is the one that should be cubed. So what basically we do at this particular point is we are going to then replace. So what is the period? Okay. What is the period? Uh, of course, we have to convert the period for what? We have to... Are, uh, use the period for the earth isn't it so we're going to use the period for the earth and because now in this particular context we're having this particular uh orbit or rather this particular satellite in relation to the earth so now we're just going to replace where where we're saying uh we are just going to use a special case of k plus third law with earth's mass replacing the sun's mass mass because now we are looking at the earth being at the center, isn't it? So you substitute the period, which you convert to seconds. So that's the, uh, the conversion that we are going to do there for the period. So when we convert it to seconds, uh, we are going to get that. So let's now write those things. So converting the period to seconds we are going to have um, now take note this is not the period required for the earth towards this it's not the period required for the earth to go around the sun we are looking at the period of the what period of the earth 
uh, to actually rotate on its own axis, right? So how you can find this is say 25, 24 hours times 60 minutes times 60 seconds. That's how we are finding that particular answer, right? So yeah, that's trying to find the number of seconds which are found in 24 hours. Since now we are talking about the Earth's rotation. Okay.